The caliphate has, in recent years, acquired a meaning beyond its original conception. This is partly because of the rise of the terror group ISIS and its claims to legitimacy. As Shadi Hamid reluctantly argues in the Atlantic magazine, ISIS draws on and draws strength from the ideas that have broad resonance amongst Muslim majority populations. They may not agree with ISIS's interpretation of the caliphate. But the notion of a caliphate, the historical political entity governed by Islamic law and tradition, is a powerful one, even among more secular-minded Muslims. Although polling on the matter is contradictory at times, most analysts of the Muslim world would surmise that religiosity is on the increase, and with it, a demand to see Islamic scripture reflected in public policy. My guest this week. Dr. Overmeer Anjum, although abhorring all that ISIS may stand for, suggests that its brief rise to notoriety has opened up a space for intelligent-minded Muslims to reimagine a world with a just caliphate. Undoubtedly, the appeal of the concept is enduring. The late professor of Islamic studies and neoconservative protagonist Bernard Lewis placed the institution at the centre of Muslim thinking since the death of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He posits it remained a potent symbol of Muslim unity, even identity, and its abolition under the double assault of foreign imperialists and domestic modernists was felt throughout the Muslim world. For Lewis, the loss of the caliphate is seen by Muslim majorities as a symbol of a century of humiliation, disunity, colonization, and despotic rule. And you can see why Muslims observe the institution of the caliphate to be intertwined. With the deep-seated memory of Islam's golden age and illustrious past, the Muslim world that once saw itself at the centre of innovation, toleration, culture, and wealth, is now synonymous with civil strife, poverty, inequality, and terror, for which the Syrian civil war and the deafening silence over the plight of the Rohingyas and the Uyghur genocides is just the latest in a long line of disasters. So, how can a reimagination of Muslim political order help the current Muslim condition? Dr. Anjum argues in a recent long read penned for the Yakin Institute that not only is there an urgent requirement for Muslim intelligentsia and civil society to debate the form a modern caliphate would take, but to seriously place it at the centre of Muslim social and political activism. He argues that Islam's challenge has to be framed in the context of the broader tumults faced by the liberal world order. Namely, the process of deglobalization and the rise of populist nativism. Dr. Anjum believes Muslims, particularly the young and those who have come to the West to escape the malaise of the Islamic world, owe it to the worldwide community to link up beyond artificial borders and to ask the fundamental questions that place Islam as an alternative to the prevailing order. The Caliphate surely does need more attention. There have been some laudable attempts in recent years to conceptualize a modern Islamic order, most notably in Pakistan by Dr. Isra Ahmed, and in the Arab world by Sheikh Taqiyuddin Al Nabhani. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala reward them for their steadfastness, courage, and contribution to the topic. However, the appeal of their movements has dissipated, and today they fail to inspire the vast majority of Muslims that look to an intelligent and radical solution for our malady. Dr. Anjum calls for a new wave of thinking on the subject, grounded in revelation and aimed at showing both Muslims and non-Muslims how Islam's thought should be considered as an alternative to the contemporary decaying world order. Dr. Avamir Anjum is Imam Khatib Endowed Chair of Islamic Studies at the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies at the University of Toledo. He's an author of a number of books. And I will place his biography in the description of this program. Dr. Anjum, welcome to my program. Now, I want to ask you about your article that、uh, appears on the Yakin Institute website. Who wants the caliphate? It's a very long read, but I would urge my listeners to、uh, to to really read it because、um, uh, it it really provides a, an interesting perspective on the subject of the caliphate. So, my question to you really is: Why the article, and why now? Um, so Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wassalamu alaikum. Wassalamu alaikum. Thank you very much for inviting me 
to your podcast and for uh, a really wonderful set of questions uh, that you've sent me and, and um, uh, for this opportunity. Uh, what prompted me to ask this question was, uh, or rather, uh, what made this question urgent for me? Because the question, I think, is perennial in Islamic thought. And I argue anyone who looks at Islamic thought, uh, whether you look at law or, or whether you look at politics, or even if you look at um, uh, ethical literature, um, you find that there is a sense in which there are certain problems, certain uh, there is an assumption that Muslims live in an order that is Islamic and there are certain questions, for example, in Islamic law that can be resolved only by quote-unquote sultan or the imam. Um, and sultan here just means in, in this Islamic legal literature, the authority, uh, which is the authority of the caliph. It is always assumed that uh, Islamic law can't really exist, unlike it's often uh, assumed to, in the modern period, it does not exist without an Islamic authority, uh, that is Islamic political authority. And so I think the question is why made, the, made it uh, an urgent matter for me? And, and in short, it is the bloody borders of the Muslim world, the migrants, the snowballing uh, migrant populations, the Muslim children found floating on European floors. Take your pick. Uh, they are the ones who want it, and I wanted to question and, and dislodge uh, this, the quote-unquote spokesperson for Islam, Western Muslims or, or uh, elites that are moneyed or um, Muslim, most of all, Muslim despots and their um, servants and attaches and establishment clerics. They don't speak for Muslims. The majority of Muslims, in my view, are what's most important. The people who are uh, who do not benefit from the shrinking populate from the shrinking uh, benefits of of citizenship and protection by their nation states, and many of them never did. Um, those are the ones to me are the the ones that should be at the center of any moral and ethical Islamic thinking. And I think about this question strictly within Islamic theology and, and law, uh, within Islamic ethics, uh, within the imperatives of uh, the Quran and the Sunnah and the reason uh, that is authorized by uh, our religion. And um, to me, there is no doubt that it is the, as Prophet Sallallahu said in a hadith that, you know, if you're moving in a caravan, you should move at the speed of the slowest one among you. And to me, that's always been a moving metaphor for how you think about collective decision-making and collective visioning of, of the community. And, and that is essentially what politic, politics is. I think it has been an error made by some uh, even representatives of our ulama or our tradition uh, who go for power and money. Um, and unfortunately, many of these people become spokespersons and representatives as if they embody and own and speak for the tradition, but they only are doing so because somebody has given them the speaker phone and I wanted to take it away from them. Now, it seems to me, Dr. Anjan, that you do see the caliphate as an idea that transcends the current problems in the Muslim world. You talk about the despots and you talk about the Arab oil monarchies uh, and uh, how maybe Muslim scholarship has been compromised by these governments. But it seems to me that you're arguing for something greater than that. You suggest in your article that Islam and the caliphate provides a solution to the prevailing liberal order. Uh, can you expand on what you mean by that? Right. I think that that's a, that's, a, that's a very accurate reading of what I'm trying to do. I'm not saying that merely that this, the caliphate should be back because Muslims are suffering, but rather to me, Muslims are suffering as a symptom of fundamental structural problems that can be um, pointed out and discussed and negotiated with um, the intellectual, uh, the honest intellectuals, 
uh, and scholars, uh, whether they're Christian or, or, or non-religious or, or, or Hindu or, 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 or Jews. Um, and so to me, these are two different levels of the discourse. The fundamental, one, one say, when, when, you, when I'm speaking to Muslims, to believers, I must emphasize and the, that, uh, that we, we owe other Muslims a fundamental debt. And by we, I mean the privileged Muslims who have time uh, to think and who have security of food and, um, and uh, lives and limbs. We owe it to the increasing majority of Muslims who do not have either those protections altogether or um, they're barely hanging on working two jobs and living in essentially uh, these polluted trash cans uh, of our, our countries and societies and uh, that the beautiful societies that they did have, that, uh, that the, the best features of their societies are being both attacked intellectually by Western lackeys, by half-cooked intellectuals, by um, superficial modernists on the one hand, but most of all by uh, they're being taken away by the despots who want to keep them on the edge so they don't have time to think. I think we owe it to them to, to, to do this thinking for them. Um, now, the liberal order has many Critics, and I would in fact say that most serious thinkers in the world today are uh, deep critics of the liberal order. I don't mean that they're critics in the sense that, well, a uh, liberal order should be fixed up this way or that way, but many serious philosophers and political scientists and you know, folks who are doing history of colonialism and or those who are looking at the economy and capitalism um, are deep critics of the liberal order in the sense that it is what has brought us, us as humanity, on the brink of total disaster. That that it is the biggest alibi of capitalism. Um, so liberal order was always unrealistic. It has been hypocritical and imperialist. It, it both in the sense that it's unrealistic in its dreamy vision of. Uh, of human rights for all, but then it necessarily falls into hypocrisy and imperialism because not everybody can have it. So you basically end up, end up with an order where some have and uh, at the expense of others. And then the winners become uh, so big that they can indeed create great prosperity, you know, for any pyramids to be built, the great uh, marvels of, of, of Egyptian civilization, you need a million slaves. So basically the pyramids of modernity uh, uh, require many, many uh, slaves around the world. Uh, and, and so to me, liberal order is not, you know, liberal orders, liberals see themselves as critics of that order. Oh, we want equality, we want, but in fact, by taking away the most important element that could prevent capitalism, which is transcendental values, values that are pre-political and non-political, around which people can build communities and create uh, resistance to capitalism. By taking away those, right, that's what liberalism by definition is. There are no values that are pre-political. By taking those values away, it leaves individuals, uh, communities broken into helpless individuals depending on that depend on states who have uh, states that have inevitably uh, secular and self-centered logics um, that often of course ally themselves with capitalism a very capitalist elite of various kinds so I think that there is a fundamental structural problem second the current nation state order is unsustainable in my view uh, it's unsustainable both economically politically and morally it's irrational. Um, it's morally unsustainable, most of all, because there are always minorities that don't fit in the national narrative, whether they're Kurds in Turkey or um, Sunnis or Shiites in Iraq or, you know, uh, in Iran. You always have basically people who don't fit. Uh, and of course, 
the United States and Europe um, have fought wars for precisely those reasons. So I think that the, the, the model is problematic. Uh, it's also un-Islamic, in my view, deeply un-Islamic theologically, because sovereignty of a group of Muslims um, has no justification in Islamic legal or theological orders. In other words, there is no justification in Islam for, say, Egyptian Muslims fighting a war with, say, Sudanese Muslims, where Egyptian believer and Egyptian atheists fight side and side, side by side to, to kill the Sudanese because the Egyptian state, the nation state has decided, has declared the Sudan their enemy, right? Nation state uh, logic requires, even if you take away all the other undesirable parts of nationalism, nation state loyalty requires that, the, uh, that this must happen. That if your uh, soldiers are not, uh, if if you don't give your loyalty to the state and follow the follow that imperative, um, then you are not um, a proper nation state citizen. You're a traitor. That's the fundamental logic of the nation state, and it is fundamentally un-Islamic. Um, and what you're seeing, what Saudis are doing in Yemen or what Iranians are doing in Syria, these massacres, um, they're just a result of this nation state uh, order where uh, to their Muslim populations, they may do this propaganda and justify it in sectarian religious terms, which I think is, uh, is a sign of how the, it doesn't work in Islamic sort of religious framework. But their real logic is real politic of, of regional politics. Um, so to me, uh, nation state order is at a theoretical level, on Islamic. Now you write that the nation state is going through a period of deglobalization and the rise of populism, nativist populism. Uh, but when you evaluate some of the counter arguments or the counter currents against the prevailing liberal order, Islam currently doesn't feature as a prominent challenger to to this uh, to this uh, order. In fact, uh, the most prominent challenge comes from within. It comes from the left. Uh, if you think about Noam Chomsky or others in in that tradition, uh, they tend to come from. Uh, the left or the post-socialist tradition. Why does Islam not feature in, in this debate at the moment? So I think part of my my response to your question is yes and no. Part, I mean, I agree that uh, Islam is absent from certain um, avenues uh, of exploration. And you're right that lib that leftist liberalism, not, not full-fledged sort of socialism, but certainly leftist liberalism, are uh, 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 left liberalist activism is at the forefront of this. Um, but only if you're looking in those elite spaces which are allowed to talk and which we, uh, um, you know, ascribe valence and importance to. But I, I think that Islam features everywhere, positively and negatively. Negatively is, of course, in the war and terror which defines the modern, uh, the current world order after 9-11. Um, for every country, uh, for one, Israel, China, India, uh, Myanmar, uh, Islam has become the other, the enemy that justifies policy, that justifies identity politics of a, of, of, of a new kind. And so... Islam is, of course, there always as the fodder for white nationalism or for the Chinese state oppression and for the Indian right-wing Hindu fanaticism and for Myanmar Buddhist fanaticism. Islam is always there. And uh, it doesn't appear in the solutions because people are, of course, scared. I mean, that's the answer to that is, da, if you are a, a powerless, a powerless uh, activist in Egypt, um, you are scared to think of your solution in terms of Islam, even if in your daily life uh, you practice Islam. So it's only in those broken spaces where you have no hope, that you don't even have anyone 
looking out for you to fear um, those ungoverned areas where um, talking about Islam becomes the only option and you, you know, the Uyghur would ask what are other Muslims can, you know, what can other Muslims do to help us? It's the Uyghur, it's the Rohingya, it's the, the Palestinians, it's the, the Kashmiris who are asking these questions. And, and these minorities, these populations are increasing. Not only is it an outside threat, of course, but it, but the but the, the Muslim uh, authoritarian rulers themselves use this war on terror and this sort of negativity about Islam to and they co-opt it very successfully. In fact, they co-opt it most successfully because they they uh, they they stand most to gain from the threat of an Islamic opposition, a, a new order in which they will not have the uh, absolute power that they do. So I see that Islam appears, in fact, the world is obsessed with Islam. Yes, I suppose that is the case, Dr. Ranjan. Uh, the world is obsessed with Islam, but it's obsessed in the context of uh, terrorism and the war on terror. It doesn't see Islam, or at least the debate hasn't moved on to view Islam as an alternative to the prevailing liberal world order. I mean, back to your article, you talk about the rise of ISIS and you say that it took the, uh, the rise of a bad caliphate for us to discuss uh, the rise of a good caliphate. But I must note in recent uh, years, especially in the second wave of the Arab Spring, Islam has been notably absent. If you think about uh, the current demonstrations rocking uh, parts of the Muslim world, Iraq, in Lebanon, uh, and, 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 uh, and Sudan, you actually observe the absence of an Islamic counter-narrative and uh, what, seems to ha what seems to have replaced the, uh, the vacuum of, of political activism is a call for a civil democratic state. It seems like it's business as usual. We're, we're back to uh, the preserve of the nation state. I don't quite see it that way. I don't think that how people in Lebanon and Iraq see their very practical possibilities um, is really a comment on either their ultimate desires uh, or what uh, a reasonable and sustainable alter alternative could be. These are not uh, leaders, political scientists and thinkers who have the luxury to think long term. Um, so in this sort of very limited, very reactionary politics, um, so I'll give you an example. Some of these people who are very active in Lebanon, who are dear friends of mine, if you were to sit down and talk to them about what their real uh, aspiration would be, they would say, without missing a heartbeat, uh, yes, we would look to a day when Muslims could be united. Uh, but they don't have the imagination and the luxury of thinking uh, 10, 20, 30 years down the line. They don't have that luxury because they have to respond to a uh, very uh, immediate problem. So I don't think that uh, that's necessarily the most compelling way of reading what Muslim aspirations are. Um, people, you know, even if you go and survey people, people respond to what they see as would be a beneficial thing immediately to them. So most of these surveys, in fact, you know, surveys would show, some of the surveys would show like, you know, 80% Muslims want Sharia and want Islam and their governance and so on. I don't think that that's the way to poll Muslim thought. Um, but when I do go around and, and look at what um, younger, especially younger scholars and activists are thinking about, um, I find that I have never seen in my active life when I have been involved in thinking and writing about the Muslim world since the late 90s, as much clarity about the desire for the caliphate 
um, as I'm seeing now in the last few years. Now, in your article, you talk about the three main arguments against the caliphate: its uh, undesirabilities, unfeasibility, and whether it's religiously necessary. Why do you argue these uh, three uh, counter arguments are without merit? Um, these three elements: the so religious necessity, whether Muslims are obliged to do that or not. It was an agree- It was. It has been agreed on by ijma, and by definition, ijma remains. Um, but in any account of Islam um, that is not uh, entirely modernist, in any account of Islam that is not entirely that has entirely thrown away uh, the traditional usul al fiqh, uh, ijma is the main source of uh, of norm making, and to me. If you are willing to do away with ijma, then there can be no religious argument in my view, right? Because even the Quran, the meaning of the Quran is, right, stabilized by the community and the agreement of the ijma, so is hadith. So if you're willing to do that, then intellectually there is no coherent way to approach tradition whatsoever. And that's why I don't engage with people who might say, oh, those were just you know, Abu Bakr was was just making up sort of a political uh, decision, and Ali and Omar were doing this just politically. We don't really follow the ijma of the ummah. To me, uh, the argument to those people cannot be religious because there is no coherent religious tradition at after that point. There is only um, utilitarian arguments. And there are only political arguments possible after that. So. I make the argument that it is religiously necessary, necessary by Ijma, all the scholars uh, who, who is who in Islamic tradition has signed on to this and repeated this. Um, but, and if, if all of them are useless for you, then I have no religious argument for you. To me, you're just not a religious sort of type of thinker. You may be a, a, a perfect Muslim uh, in, 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 in certain sense, but... Uh, the argument to me should be about, uh, between such people, should be about feasibility and desirability, right? So the question then is feasibility and, and, and then desirability. Let's take desirability first. And I argue that if you look back at, if you stand back and look at the Muslim world today, um, you have a range of failing nation states or increasingly authoritarian nation states uh, and the nation state order itself is coming apart. There has to be something new because uh, increasingly nation states are no longer what they, uh, what they were designed to be in 19th century Europe. Um, and uh, the two, they, they waged the two world wars that changed the world order, and that's how nation states, sort of in very broken and questionable state, already lost their best impetus and best days. That's how they came to uh, the Muslim world, the Arab, uh, in Arabia, South Asia, Arab countries, North Africa. And um, the, nation, the nation state project never took roots there. Uh, what you now have. You do have nationalism, which is different from nation states, and I'm going to talk about that later. And those that nationalism is driven more, more by regionalism and cultural differences and ethnic differences and class differences um, that have very little to do with nationalism. Nationalism, remember, is supposed to overcome all of those other differences and consolidate people, but uh, you'll find that People, for example, Arab Springs is a perfect example. Why people, young people who can speak Arabic, contribute to the same shared public sphere in 22 Arab countries. Uh, they they seem to belong to the same sphere, and their enemy, if you will, is a shared uh, elite, uh, the military elite, or or what have you. And so, um, and then now, of course, uh, in the rise of uh, sectarianism, you have two blocks. The or three blocks, Saudi block, Turkish and Qatari block, and then you have the Iranian block. And these, you have, again, they're all transnational uh, loyalties, transnational considerations. Uh, so my general argument is that the nascent state never took root, and his, we, we, are, we stand at a moment in history where nation state has 
fundamentally dissolved into something else that the nation state elite structures and institutions do stand, but they have become simply as gatekeepers for multinational corporations for global capitalism. So the elite still are there and they would use the flag and they use their militaries, but what they're trying to do is uh, something entirely different from what nation building was about in the 19th century and 20th century, early 20th century. I think that this nation, nation, this nation state model is unfeasible uh, because it cannot guarantee either citizenship, it cannot guarantee um, equality, and it cannot guarantee freedom and dignity for its populations, even if you take the Islam out of the equation. And in my view, uh, so if you take the, the, the Islamic, right, the, the, the presence of Islam in the population, which is very, uh, I believe, strongly held, um, once you take Islam into account, you only have a, a, a further destabilizing factor for the nation state because by its very nature, Islamic authority does not recognize borders. Uh, and even in the West, in the only way you could do this nation state was completely either sub, sub, make subordinate religion or create your own national religion like the, the British did. For instance, you, you know, if you go in Egyptian streets the last couple of decades, Saudi authorities who belong to a different nation state um, have more of a sway than any Egyptian authority to say, for example, a typical Salafi. Um, similarly, you know, if you are, um, you know, if you're following Azhar University and, and the authorities that, that are big there, uh, their fatwas and their view of the social order, um, those loyalties are far more important than any authorities within the boundaries of your nation state. So Islam by its, by, by its nature makes it very difficult for people to keep their loyalties to, the, to a specific territory. So it does not work with nationalism. Now, people make the normative argument that Islam is against nationalism and whatnot, and I think that is a correct, that is correct, but I'm making an argument that is, you could say, much more political theory and social science. I think that so long as uh, there is an Islam, so long as you in the UK uh, are talking to me in the US, uh, and you think that the Islamic arguments that I will make have some validity for you, regardless of our national origins or citizenship, we're talking about Islam making um, the nation state loyalties, uh, right, subordinate to it in, in certain ways. So I think that that is happening and has been happening uh, regardless, and it's not going to stop happening. And how about the feasibility of a modern caliphate? It's often people talk about why this is impossible. Why it's impossible and my short answer to that is, it's just your lack of imagination, and that should not be uh, just because you happen to have a full tummy, and that's because you happen to have a citizenship. Um, your lack of imagination or your lack of uh, of courage, uh, and this I give this example in the uh, in the article as well. Look, people thought for two thousand years that democracy was something that happened for a couple hundred years in Athens, and uh, it was a it was a crazy idea, um, and then people imagined it, and now it is a, it has become effectively a, a new religion for the modern world, uh, at least for the not last century. People used to say, say, for example, the Arabs are different. I mean, as you know, when I went to grad school, um, the, the the wisdom on the street in in the academia in the academic halls of academia, so of course, Arabs are different, Muslims are different. So they don't, first of all. Um, they, they can't take media, right? That they don't have objective news. Um, and then late 90s, Al Jazeera came and some of the best uh, reporting uh, in, um, and it's, in, in my view, it's better than CNN and it's better than B, 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 uh, BBC today in, in many respects, even though it has to uh, like not to its political masters, but it is, a very, it's a kind of thing that people don't realize, but it was revolutionary for the Arab world that people can can analyze uh, facts and and uh, and deal with 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 difficult 
uh, questioning, uh, difficult questions and, and debate. Um, people said that the Arabs don't, the Arab street is different. They, they like the boot. In fact, this is the argument that many who were going to the Iraq war made, uh, that they only understand the boot. Uh, Bernard Lewis made this argument uh, a number of times in 1990, I think, and then later again in 2003. And then you have the entire Arab uh, world boiling over and, and saying we want dignity and we want these people out and, um, and, and did so in a way that was at least at first extremely, um, you know, uh, it was, it was nonviolent and, and organized and, uh, and so on. So I don't think that lack of our imagination is a good excuse. Now, is it a logical impossibility? Um, obviously not. Is it something that has not happened? Well, it was a hundred years ago. It was fairly uh, possible for a large number of ethnicities to live together under one um, caliph. So it is not something that's, uh, you know, it's a serious impossibility. It's simply that people think um, for reasons that are in fact beyond me, that the nation state uh, is a permanent feature in fact, a uh, philosopher Taha Abdul Rahman is, uh, you know, who's, who's, whose work was recently made more popular by Wael Halaq uh, in his recent translation, uh, Reforming Modernity, I believe. Um, he makes this argument that, um, and something that I have noticed um, quite remarkably in, 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 in certain Muslim circles, that in, in certain circles, the nation state has become a metaphysical reality like God. So that just as for you to be a Muslim, you have to believe in God. Um, you think of the current order of the state as a given. And um, this has become true, in fact, even for some uh, uh, reformists and as well as traditionalist establishments, clerics. And I think that that is, a that that has no intellectual warrant right it's not something that they've argued in the books and debated and you know what we can't really imagine anything else but no it's something it's an attitude of helplessness now let's talk about the historical uh, notion of the caliphate uh, many modernists would argue that uh, islamic history is riddled with inconsistencies uh, with discontinuities uh, and with uh, instances of of repressive caliphs um, and they would surmise that a modern caliphate just wouldn't stack up when, uh, when considering the, the types of checks and balances that a, a more liberal, uh, accountable system would provide, you know, post, post enlightenment, uh, the West has, has developed a, a, a form of representation, uh, which, uh, safeguards minorities and safeguards civil liberties. I mean, I'd say that. There, there are a number of confusions in that very common way of thinking, but that's, again, in my view, that's less of a thought and more of a feeling and an attitude of helplessness. Um, because we are confusing a lot, number of things. When you think as a political thinker and a historian of politics, you know one thing for an absolute fact. There is, there is, this is something that I can be absolutely sure of because absolutely any political history that I've read of any time and any state is that it has rebellions and it has violence and it has repression. It is taken to be in the field a fact that a political order always has people, sometimes uh, you know, the truth and justice could be on one side or the other side, or it's sometimes it's just too complicated to figure out who's right. But one thing that's for sure is that you have um, violence and instability in different kinds of rulers. So you may have, uh, you know, uh, a, and so the simple answer to that is show me a democracy where you do not have corruption, where you do not have oppression, where you do not have tyranny of the majority, um, show me a liberal order which did not engage in horrendous acts of violence if it, uh, uh, and, and, and you don't, I mean, you, you, you just simply don't have any such examples, any such orders that lasted for any uh, 
uh, period of time and, and govern any significant stretch of territory. Politics is just that. It's kind of like, you know, in the personal life, I, I like to you know, use this example I do in my article, is that if you think of a Muslim who has not committed a sin, and then as soon as you commit a sin, if you say, well, Islam doesn't really work because, look, Muslims commit sins, they don't do what Islam is saying, it is impractical. And I just say that, well, you just don't understand what morality and freedom of choice mean, uh, if that's your argument. And similarly, if you think that pointing to caliphs who didn't quite do it right is a good reason for dismissing a political order, then you don't understand what politics is about. The question then becomes, um, one of sort of proportional uh, and comparative nature. And then um, one has to compare likes with likes if you're a proper historian and proper political theorist. So for example, you cannot compare a, a short-lived or, or rather a bookish treatment of one, uh, one order with uh, what's wrong with this order uh, of of, you know, an Orientalist, an enemy's account of the other order, right? So you have to, uh, so comparison is not straightforward, in other words. And when you do that kind of comparison, you realize, in my view, uh, that the caliphate, um, yes, there were significant discontinuities, and those discontinuities existed all over the world at the time, and they continue to exist today in the liberal order. Um, you, there were there was there oppression? Yes, and and the oppression exists all over. So we're really talking about then simply a comparative preference for one over the other. Um, now, the second part of uh, your question, which also I think is a correct assessment of how many people feel, again. This is a feeling um, based on the fact that most of our self-understanding is um, indebted to the Orientalists telling us our stories uh, of, of who we were. Um, our own understanding is extremely uh, biased and extremely um, self-deprecating, in part because ulama in our tradition had lost uh, control of of our own history and of our own um, tradition, uh, and that is a serious problem. Uh, but that is a problem that cannot be solved by closing your eyes and saying, "Well, it was always bad." So basically, just there, there's nothing we can do about it. But rather, uh, in my view, taking control of that of, of our self understanding of our knowledge about ourselves, our knowledge about our past and our present and our future requires institutional and political control and uh, autonomy. Of, of, and, and that is what the caliphate should be, in my view. So I don't think that those feelings are, or attitudes uh, stand to um, serious analysis. They become serious only, in my view, this is my, based on my conversations, and you may point out that, you know, uh, there is this and that that you didn't consider. But in my view, when I'm talking to people, say, for example, who have recently come to the West, the United States, or, you know, some European country, they left poverty and they came back and became, uh, had a lot more opportunity here, became much rich richer than they were and so they were like they are like well look look at this world what it has given us look at the freedom and democracy and beauty here and look at all the bad things that are happening in the, in the muslim world right and that's become the view through which muslims a uh, middle class bourgeois muslims think about islamic history uh, and particularly western muslims and westernized muslims because we specifically live especially those who can talk those who can make their voice heard are uh, those who live in liberal bubbles around um, centers of knowledge production in the West, which happen to be 
uh, if you will, the, the, the ivory towers of the world. And, and so Muslims like myself, of course, we, are, we, we have to be very happy about the fact that uh, the opportunity that I have in the West, um, in the United States, I did not have in Pakistan. And for me to, now of course I can counter my narrative with many people who found uh, African-American Muslims, for example, who have exact opposite narratives. So it would be, a, you know, be a battle of personal narratives who find, uh, found their freedom where. Now, to what extent was the historical caliphate a single unitary institution? I note that uh, there were many inconsistencies and many different models. In fact, in your article, you talk about five broad models of the caliphate uh, that lasted throughout history. And so is the caliphate really uh, a description of a single system or is it a description of a very general idea which can translate into uh, a number of iterations depending on the uh, the era in which uh, the caliphate is applied well it all depends on what you mean by the caliphate as a model um, if you mean by the caliphate as a single institution which uh, with details on sort of how the administration is going to let be laid out and power is distributed, then yes, the caliphate is not that. Um, but if you think uh, in a way that is more organic and internal to Islam, which is that there is an ummah, there is a global community of believers, and they are obliged by God, by universal agreement of Muslim scholars to obey, to follow a certain, a given law, a sharia and a certain morality and have obligations to each other as brethren in faith. Um, and that they are the ones who appoint an authority over them that may or may not be, sort of, you know, perfect or the best, but nonetheless, it it is a caliphate in the sense that it is a successorship of the prophet's authority and care Take caretaking of his community. Um, so basically, if you think about political institutions and administration and governance, uh, then yes, it seems very discontinuous and that's entirely understandable. If you think about what you think is essential, right? And one of the things is that in the modern secularized psyche of Muslims, what is essential has transformed so that a typical alim of the Ottoman era did not think that the Ottomans were that different from the Mamluks before them or the Saljuks before them or the, um, the Buyids before them in the sense that the basic society um, and its essential problem of Muslim self-governing -govern themselves were essentially the same, which is why they're following uh, jurists from those eras without saying, hey, those jurists sort of do not constitute an authority for us because uh, they lived in an entirely different place, different society. And uh, none of that happened because uh, the society continued. Uh, differences were, uh, you know, there were always, there were always differences, but, but, uh, um, you, what you did not have is a, a, a major sort of a, a, a rupture that you have in the 19th century uh, colonial period and then in the 20th century, the rise of the nation state. Those were major ruptures. Um, but nonetheless, uh, as I emphasize in my article, that depending on how one looks at it, there are different models of the caliphate. That in its essence, what a caliphate is, a caliph is not a, uh, a ruler of a state, ruler of a territory, per se, first and foremost. A caliph is the head of the ummah. And the territoriality in Islamic political imagination is secondary to the community. Whereas in the modern nation state, territoriality is the first consideration and then community is forged, regardless of faith and belief and, you know, uh, transcendental considerations, community is forged. Um, and nationalization, if you will, national history is created and myths are created. So, um, you know, Benedict Anderson's idea of imagined communities, the community is imagined and then taught in high school and then wars are fought and flags are 
are glorified and nations are built that way. Uh, well, you have a very different model. And, and one of the reasons I think that uh, modern Muslims, including uh, some very well-meaning Islamic thinkers uh, who are not historians, cannot disabuse themselves of the categories in which they think. And the, those categories are, uh, are modern and recent, but they don't know that. And this is what some of the scholars, when they say that they, people take the state to be a metaphysical reality, that's what they mean. Um, that they think that the questions that they're asking are trans-historical, trans-local, and therefore God must have provided and the Prophet must have provided salam, answers to them in, in specific terms because uh, these, are, these are timeless, universal, fundamental questions. Uh, but those who do history, um, those who are aware, uh, whether traditional Muslim historians or, or, or modern historians, uh, are aware that these questions are, are recent. And this was, in fact, one of the points of uh, debate between traditionalists and and, and reformists, uh, what are the categories in which one should think? And, and I, my own thinking about this is very historically informed. Uh, I do not, first of all, subscribe to this view that you had Umar ibn al-Khattab, his model was uh, what we all look to, that's a real caliphate, and then after that there is complete decline. In fact, I'm writing a history, historical survey of, of that period precisely, in, in part to, to make that point. And in fact, to me, um, some of the best institutional innovation takes place in the time of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. And then after that, the Abbasids continue the institutional development. And um, by the same time, there is some deterioration. One of the reasons why I don't engage with much existing caliphate or pro caliphate discourse um, by some people who have uh, done great work, whether it's Hasb al Tahrir, uh, uh, Sheikh Tafiuddin Nabhani, or uh, Dr. Isra Ahmed in, in Pakistan, and, and many other such groups, in fact, around the world. I was surprised to find there are many, many uh, such groups, many more than we typically think. And, but their thinking is ahistorical. So even though I appreciate that they keep the idea alive, sometimes the way they present it makes the idea ridiculous. Um, in the eyes of those who may otherwise be willing to think about it. Um, and, and so, in short, in my argument is that, look, if the caliphate is indeed a medieval theocracy, then, or medieval theocratic absolutism, as some of these people present, then it would indeed be a bad idea. It would, in fact, possibly even worse than the kind of disaster that exists today. But I demonstrate, however, uh, in you know, a sort of a gesture in my article and demonstrate uh, in my work that both history and normative Muslim theory, both medieval and modern, suggest a range of possibilities for the actualization of the caliphate. Um, and that the longest lasting version of the caliphate was um, sort of how it consolidated in the late Abbasid period. Um, and it was a uh, not absolutist institution. It was a nomocratic, meaning that it is the rule of law, uh, not the rule of the divine will of the caliph. Um, it, so it was a nomocratic institution in which the powers of the caliph were limited uh, in both in practice and in theory. Uh, neither the theory nor the practice were uh, perfect. They were not perfect reflection of what Islam teaches but they were not a betrayal of what Islam teaches, but rather they were um, very practical sort of uh, uh, adjustments to a difficult world. This was also a world, by the way, that one of the reasons why the Abbasids went down was because you have uh, uh, invasions of uh, nomadic warriors from the north and, um, and the ones that continued for centuries until the rise of the Ottomans. So, and this, by the way, is happening across the world from China and Japan to Western Europe. You have invasions that lead to breakdown of uh, imperial orders into smaller kingdoms. And then uh, a few hundred years, they come back together. Um, 
So there are material historical reasons why the caliphate uh, took various forms. And it is on that basis that I argue that in the modern world, when uh, both, you know, where technology and the availability of education, the availability of um, uh, the means of long-term governance and agreement uh, enable us to think of large systems with large diversity, whether it's like the United States or, uh, or China or European Union, that can be governed by uh, a, a, a single, you know, f- sort of federal apparatus with, with large uh, local autonomy. So it's, it's like an undergraduate project where you think about a caliph, you know, basically telling everybody what to do. That's just uh, sophomoric and unacceptably uh, bad thinking. But I think that um, a unification of economy, a unification of, uh, of, uh, of, of defense, um, which may be a, uh, a top-down project, which may be a bottom-up project, I think those are things that are up for discussion and for further scholarship. Uh, but those, I argue, that are a unification of defense, unification of the uh, of economy and movement of labor and movement of goods, um, those would be decidedly, from an economic perspective, from political perspective, from a social perspective, good things for this region. Now, let's turn to the West. Now, of course, any project to reimagine the caliphate um, is going to be up against a, a machinery uh, which uh, at its at its uh, very least wants to prevent the rise of peer competitors around around the world. And um, uh, in your article, you mentioned that for a century now, Islam has not allowed to be Islam. And I, I get from that that uh, you believe there is a political project to keep Islam submissive. In fact, I remember you used the term uh, after the war on terror, the West would only settle for an emasculated Islam. Um, I mean, what... How do you imagine the West will uh, will react or respond to any serious intellectual endeavor or political endeavor for Muslim unification? Um, so there are a couple of things that I, I think have a couple of generalizations that um, we often fall into, including myself, uh, such as West and modernity, um, that are not real things. So... I think that they're Western elite and the Western elite is what I mean when I use the word West, but the Western elite are are embattled, they are divided, they are humans, they make, you know, they they make decisions that are fundamentally self-destructive for them. That idea that um, the Western elite, of course, do not want Islam to become a threat to them that is uh, rudimentary, but at the same time, the Western elite are so embattled. Um, so we're living in a world where the West has lost credibility. If there is a the West, uh, West is not a happy place. It is a rich place, but it's a place that knows that it's going downhill and it is going to hit the bottom very very soon, and that it has destroyed the only planet we had, and it economic inequalities that it has explored, exported all over the world are going to come back and, and hit it very hard. And, and that uh, it's the enemies uh, are within. Um, and so I don't think that, uh, although the Western elite are likely to, or many Western elite are likely to oppose the idea at first, but to me, they're not an interesting problem. Um, a consensus uh, or, or a serious discourse among Muslims thinking 10, 20, 30, 40 years uh, down the line, um, creating that consensus that, look, this is something how that we have to have our own imagination about our future. That's a much more interesting problem to me. To me, the dictators in the Muslim world uh, are not the biggest problem either. They are going to be our biggest obstacle 
but they're going to be a successful obstacle only if um, they are more committed to their interests than young, thoughtful Muslims, um, the younger generations of Muslims uh, are committed to their own Islamic identity and, uh, and survival and decent, honorable survival. I think that if we are, uh, if we can show that, look, we can last, uh, we can survive, whether it's MBS and MBZs and, and dictators of the world, um, and, and then these, are, these people are going to um, turn to better ideas or uh, better ideas that are out there. Uh, I think of history not in terms of sort of revolutions or evolution or, or education, but rather um, you have um, moments and cracks when um, the ideas that are available in the discursive sphere, they're picked up by whoever happens to be in power. And... Um, you know, it could be Imran Khan in Pakistan, who is just a simple, simple-minded, in fact, nationalist who is going to look for what are popular ideas that are available at this time. And if nothing is available, then uh, you know he's going to pick up the most simplistic nationalist ideas that are uh, that are available. He's going to read a book by written by a modern uh, by some Orientalist about Islam, and is going to try to implement that model because that's all that's available. And so that's, to me, it's the production of that discourse that is our greatest challenge as um, Muslim scholars and intellectuals. Now, what do you hope to achieve from your article and your engagements on this subject? Well, I hope that uh, mine is the first drop. Perhaps it's not even the first drop. It's one of many drops that are already, that are already there collecting in the, in the bucket. I shouldn't say it's the first drop, in fact, that, that's patently false. There are many people whose work has inspired me. Um, and um, I think that's how it begins. Before the flood, there, is a, there are drops. Now, without going into the specifics of the different movements that exist that either place the caliphate as a short-term goal or a long-term goal, it is fair to say that these movements have lost currency on the Muslim street. I mean, uh, if you think about uh, the heyday of, uh, of uh, groups like the Brotherhood or Hezb al-Tahrir, those days are gone. And uh, we now have a, a vacuum when it comes to uh, caliphate discourse on the streets in the Muslim world. Uh, now, some could naively then surmise that uh, that's because there is a uh, a, a decline in in the uh, the belief in a caliphate. Now, I suppose you argue otherwise. So, how would you place the failure or otherwise of of these movements? So, one of the things that people often do is they confuse social movement organizations with social movements, and in some ways, the two. You know, social movement organizations become the center when the social movement is is dead or you know, threatened. Um, and I think that um, the particular movement that you mentioned, um, some of them have done wonderful work, and and um, and also I think they have serious flaws. But these are social movement organizations; they don't control the vast majority of Muslim thought. Um, and they control increasingly less because they fail to produce the most interesting ideas, most original thinking, most, um, most uh, compelling thinking. That is what needs to be done to, to allow Muslims to think, to break through certain, uh, this, this, these, uh, so the, the false uh, narratives to disabuse ourselves of uh, a number of impossibilities that we have imposed upon ourselves, but also uh, of the simplistic narrative. And I think also we are tyrannized by the present. Um, you're always thinking, oh, no, no, when I say we, I'm, I mean Muslim thinkers, particularly normative Muslim thinkers, the ulama or the intellectuals who are worried about Islamic sort of, uh, uh, you know, state of the ummah, 
they're always thinking about, you know, I have this question that somebody has asked and I must answer it and I must answer it now. So for example, somebody asked, can you live in a society without interest and without usury? And it's such a big problem. And um, you either tell them a solution that they can implement today or uh, you, you have no answer to them. And this, in fact, this is a conversation I remember from when I was teaching in Qatar and uh, there was a debate among Muslim uh, academics working on the question of Islamic economics and they're criticizing very deeply and thoughtfully the, the, the quote-unquote Islamic banking system um, and they're saying there's nothing Islamic about it whereas the Sharia scholars are saying well what should, I, what should I tell people if there is no Islamic banking then there is un-Islamic banking and I must say that that is okay for them so the answer for a mufti is basically I have to find one or two, I have to give a yes or no answer. And if I just keep telling people no, that is, uh, they're not going to uh, uh, listen to me and I'm gonna lose clients and there is, there is nothing. But of course, often in, in real life, the real situation is that you're, you're, you're living in a structure where both yes and no are bad answers. And, and you gotta question the structure. You, you gotta ask deeper questions and you gotta think longer term. And that longer term thinking requires both peace of mind and an institutional and intellectual depth and foresight that our scholars, our institutions do not grant. Um, and that is the space that I think we need to create first in, in our minds, in our discourses, and then hopefully in our institutions. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Of Amir Anjan for your time today. Now, if my listeners wanted to find out more and wanted to read more about your thoughts on this subject, uh, where can they go? Uh, good question. I'm hoping to write, in fact, a book on this uh, to turn my article into a book. So there is going to be certainly more. But if there is anybody who would like to uh, provide a critique, uh, draw my attention to something I said that was wrong, and I'm sure there were many things that I said that were wrong. If there's anything good that I said, it is certainly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, and not me. Uh, but, and, and, and so uh, I am extremely happy to, to, to hear any, um, any criticism and any pointers for improvement, especially as I develop this argument um, into a longer form. Uh, people are more than welcome to contact me uh, my email, you could use my university email. It's really easy to find uh, find me on the internet. Well, thank you for your time today, Dr. Ovamir Anjum. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept uh, from you and your your great work and, and bring this to, to some sort of fruition, inshallah, in a, in a positive direction. I mean, you as well. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.